Thank you, Yuri. Thanks, Yuri. <clears throat> it's, it's really my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Kenneth Friedland um, using uh, Zoom here at Yale. Uh, Dr. Friedland is uh, probably one of the foremost authorities on the role of depression uh, in uh, heart disease and its contribution of depression to cardiac recurrence and early mortality in patients with heart disease. Dr. Friedland is a professor of psychiatry and psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Hawaii in 1982. He is a founding fellow of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy and also a fellow of the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research, the Society of Behavioral Medicine, the Society of Health Psychology, the American Psychological Association, and the American Heart Association. He is also now the head of the Summer Institute in Behavioral Clinical Trials that is offered by the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research in the, in the National Institutes of Health, and has written important papers on how to determine proper control groups in clinical trial, and has been an important voice on guidelines for powering clinical trials appropriately. He's the editor-in-chief of the journal Health Psychology, one of the foremost journals in his field, and has written over 200 peer-reviewed uh, published manuscripts. Um, I met Ken in the early 1990s in the context of the Enriched Clinical Trial, and he became one of the band of brothers um, who conducted uh, this uh, very difficult uh, but landmark clinical trial being the first of its kind uh, multi-site study fun funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, looking at treatment of depression in post-MI patients and um, over the years has become a close colleague and friend and um, the person, my go-to person as a dive buddy. Um, and so Dr. Friedland will be talking with us today about depression, self-care and rehospitalization and heart failure. Great, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. It's a, a real honor to uh, speak uh, at this uh, department. Um, and I, I want to say, uh, Matt, in addition to uh, you being a colleague, uh, you and your colleagues there at Yale have contributed uh, an incredible uh, number of, of important papers in cardiovascular behavioral medicine uh, in such areas as the role of mental stress in uh, myocardial ischemia and arrhythmias uh, and PTSD and so forth. I know. Uh, um, uh, working with uh, Dr. Lampert and Dr. Sufer, uh, a lot of good things have come out of that. And I, I also want to say uh, on, more directly on the topic that I'm talking about today, um, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the papers that have inspired me to study what I'm going to be talking about today have come out of uh, your department. Um, and I particularly want to highlight uh, Dr. Krumholtz and uh, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, um, some of their papers have, have had uh, a strong influence on my thinking about what I uh, should or shouldn't be looking at um, in terms of uh, outcomes in heart failure patients. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, several questions. One is, uh, does Depression increase the risk of rehospitalization in patients with heart failure. Does it affect other outcomes? I'm just going to touch on that briefly. And uh, does depression get in the way of heart failure self-care? Um, then uh, turning to heart failure self-care itself, does that uh, really uh, do much good in terms of reducing the risk of rehospitalization? And then a little, uh, uh, towards the end in terms of what we know about the treatment of comorbid depression in patients with heart failure and interventions to improve uh, heart failure self-care. So uh, as uh, I'm sure you're all aware, Medicare uh, started a program several years ago called the uh, Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program. And they calculate uh, the excess readmission ratio for, for each hospital. Um, this is uh, the 30-day rate at, at the target hospital versus the average hospital with a uh, similar case mix. 
And it's calculated for patients admitted for any of six conditions, one of which is heart failure. And if the hospital uh, gets in any uh, fiscal year an, an ERR score higher than one, it gets penalized uh, for up to 3% of all Medicare payments. And um, that, that's a pretty serious financial hit. So because of this program, most research in recent years on rehospitalization has focused on 30-day readmissions. But at our center uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, we have been not focusing so much on 30-day readmission, but, but rather on multiple readmissions over longer intervals. And we do that for several reasons. One is uh, in order to study depression as a predictor of readmissions. And that's because uh, depression in many cases is a chronic or an episodic disorder. It's not just a short-term problem. And it, uh, it may have little impact on 30-day readmissions. In fact, uh, a paper by Krumholtz and colleagues suggested that the broader array of psychiatric problems in heart failure patients uh, may not uh, be apparent uh, within the, the first 30 days after an admission. Um, and also because of its chronic or episodic nature, uh, we uh, believe that uh, depression may have more of an impact over longer periods. And then we also look at multiple readmissions in order to study uh, patient self-care as a predictor of readmissions. And um, that's also because uh, self-care is a long-term challenge for patients. It's not just sort of a one and done kind of a thing. And uh, the way the patients engage in and the way that they enact uh, self-care may change over the course of heart failure. Um, this uh, uh, graph really uh, had a, a strong influence on my thinking about this. This um, tracks uh, a typical kind of a case of heart failure from the diagnosis and first admission um, through the terminal phase as you go from left to right. And um, we can see here, after the first uh, hospitalization for heart failure, there is a, a pretty steep rise in the risk of uh, additional admissions. But after a while, there's a kind of a tapering off of that high readmission rate and the patient goes into kind of a plateau phase where things are a little more stable. And then towards the end of life, uh, there's a steep increase in rehospitalizations again. And so it occurred to me that uh, any given 30-day period that we might arbitrarily pick, if we're not just studying patients with, with newly diagnosed heart failure, but we're, we're finding patients wherever they happen to be in the course of their heart failure career, you can imagine that a 30-day uh, readmission risk means something very different in these different phases of the course of heart failure. And so that's another reason why we thought we better take a step back and look at the bigger picture over the longer term rather than just narrowly focusing on 30 days. Uh, depression is a very common problem in the general population. It uh, can range from mild to very, very severe. Uh, and it comes in many different forms, uh, including the the temporal aspects of it. It can be uh, a sort of a time-limited episode, it could be recurrent, or it can be uh, quite chronic. And as common as depression is in the general population, it's even more common in medically ill patients. In a, a chronically medically ill patient, a typical case is sort of moderately severe and relatively chronic. Um, and uh, one of the important things to know about it is that the first episode of depression very often predates medical illness and often uh, by years or decades. Uh, so when you see somebody who's got a serious illness and they're also depressed, it's not safe to assume that they're depressed because they're medically ill. The illness probably contributes to the depression, but it's not the whole story by any means. As a matter of fact, um, there is a um, high uh, genetic component uh, to uh, depression. The estimated heritability of liability, depending on the study, for unipolar depression ranges from about 37% to about 
So the more depression there is in the uh, first degree relatives, the higher chances that the patient's going to be uh, experiencing uh, some depression during their lifetime. Uh, the, the risk is also affected by adversities in childhood or uh, adolescence, and also recent stressful life events or chronically stressful circumstances. And those kinds of stressors may be related or unrelated to the medical illness. Uh, measured depression is a diagnostic category in the American Psychiatric Association's uh, DSM-5 manual, and it's also in uh, ICD-10. To diagnose major depression, uh, the patient has to manifest at least five symptoms most of the day, nearly every day during the same two week period. And at least one of those symptoms has to be depressed mood, feeling sad, down, hopeless, et cetera, or a loss of interest or pleasure in most activities. Um, and then um, at least several of the following symptoms, a change in appetite or weight, a uh, change in sleep, a uh, change in uh, psychomotor patterns with either agitation or retardation, or in some cases, both. Uh, feelings of uh, severe uh, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt. Uh, difficulty concentrating or, or uh, uh, profound difficulty making decisions. And recurrent thoughts of death. Uh, not just normal thoughts about you know, the risk of dying from illness, but uh, sort of morbid thoughts of death or suicidal ideation or even frank suicidal behavior. Uh, and it's also important that uh, these symptoms are at a level that they cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or some other important area of functioning. Uh, because some of these uh, symptoms are, are at, at low levels or just a normal part of life for many of us, but uh, at a more severe level, they can have a, an important impact on functioning. There, is, there are various different subtypes of depression, and one I want to uh, particularly draw your attention to is what's known as atypical major depression. Uh, this has the same uh, list of symptoms, except that um, the depressed mood tends to be more reactive. In other words, in, in a typical major depression, nothing cheers the person up. In atypical depression, uh, good news or a happy occasion might lead to a brightening of mood. But instead of uh, decreased appetite or uh, loss of weight, like you might expect somebody with depression to have, they experience an increase in appetite or weight gain. And they also, instead of having insomnia, they are sleeping too much. They can't wake up. They can't get out of bed. They feel uh, tired and fatigued. Uh, they tend to have psychomotor retardation and with a feeling of leaden paralysis, which is a kind of a sense of like, I'm stuck to the couch, I can't get up, I feel like I'm weighed down. And so as you can imagine, this can really interfere with activities and uh, uh, engagement in the sorts of things that people need to do to take care of themselves when they're ill. There's also a uh, often a lifelong pattern of uh, uh, sensitivity to being rejected by other people. So this can interfere with social functioning. Um, how do we assess depression? Well, major depression, again, is a psychiatric disorder. And so when we diagnose it for research purposes, we do it with a structured interview. And uh, it's diagnosed clinically by a clinical interview. This isn't something that really should just be done by a screening questionnaire. Uh, people can also have milder forms of depression. Uh, it's often referred to as minor depression. And uh, it's the same symptoms as major depression, except uh, fewer of them. And uh, it's important to try as best we can to differentiate between minor depression versus a full-fledged case of major depression, but the one that's in partial remission. So the person was more severely depressed, and now they're on the way to getting better, and they have fewer symptoms. And there's also a, a more chronic form of uh, low-level depression that's called dyslimia. And unlike minor depression, we don't expect dyslimia to necessarily go away. It's often something that people live with for years. Uh, a popular questionnaire known as the PHQ-9 can be used to screen for all of the above. And um, it's a nine-item questionnaire, can be used for uh, screening. In fact, the first two items 
uh, have good sensitivity and, and specificity and can be used for rapid screening. And that's because those two items are the, the two cardinal symptoms, the depressed mood and um, loss of interest. So if they don't have either one of those, you don't even uh, really need the, uh, the other symptoms to reach the uh, conclusion to uh, rule, the, rule out depression. But um, people can score anywhere from zero to 27 on this. And um, up to about 14, it's not that much cause for concern. It would be better if the score were lower. When you start getting scores of 15 or higher, uh, that is cause for concern and uh, very possibly treatment. When you get into the range of about 20 uh, or higher, this is pretty severe depression and it's definitely worth um, attention and uh, probable treatment. Um, there was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm diverting uh, briefly from heart failure to talk about coronary heart disease because there's been a lot more research on depression and coronary heart disease uh, than on heart failure. Uh, but, uh, and there've been at least six and, and maybe more meta-analyses of this literature. But this is one uh, that's, that's, I think, informative. Uh, depression is a um, significant predictor of the incidence of uh, coronary disease. Uh, it's also a predictor of uh, mortality in patients with established coronary disease. Um, the uh, covariate adjusted effect, uh, the relative risk is uh, 1.8 uh, in the meta-analysis with 34 studies. In the studies that also adjusted for left ventricular ejection fraction, the effect was still uh, uh, significant, but a little lower. And I think it's important to recognize that um, when that happens, it's because people are studying populations of coronary patients with some heart failure patients mixed in, people with heart failure and also ischemic heart disease. And that I think is why adjustment for LVEF in those populations has the uh, effect that it does. Mostly when we've looked within heart failure populations per se, adjustment for LVEF doesn't uh, really change the effect of depression. So it depends on the population that you're studying. In another meta-analysis, uh, this uh, looked at the point prevalence of major depression and heart failure. They came up with uh, an average of 22% uh, point prevalence of full-fledged major depression. The prevalence of milder forms of depression, like milder depression, is in the same neighborhood. It's roughly around 20%. So when you add all that up, you'll find uh, at any given time up to 40% of patients with heart failure have some level of depression. A study that we did a number of years ago, uh, we found that um, there's an interaction between age and New York heart class in terms of the prevalence of depression. So with increasing New York heart classes, um, the prevalence of depression goes up quite a bit, but that's particularly true in the younger patients, uh, in other words, patients younger than 60. And the patients uh, who are younger than 60 and in class four have a very high chance of having uh, major depression. We found that two thirds of them were uh, currently depressed when we uh, assessed them. Depression predicts uh, poor quality of life and heart failure, even after adjusting for the severity of heart failure and a range of uh, medical comorbidities. And uh, now getting into uh, a study that we published uh, several years ago, we, uh, enrolled a cohort of 685 patients uh, hospitalized with heart failure at Washington University Medical Center back in the mid to late 1990s. And uh, we followed them for a year to look at uh, multiple rehospitalizations. The, uh, the average age was about 66, but as you can see, the, the depressed patients uh, were a few years uh, younger than average. And we had about 50% women and uh, about 40% uh, African Americans in the uh, sample. Uh, when we did a, uh, a LU marginal rates model of multiple readmissions over one year, depression was a significant predictor 
and also uh, race uh, was associated with more readmissions, as was COPD and some other uh, labs. This is a, a plot of what that model looks like. It, it's probably not familiar to most of you. So let me just say, uh, these three lines represent non-depressed patients, patients who had minor depression at the index admission and patients with major depression. Each triangle represents one rehospitalization of a patient who had that particular diagnosis at the baseline. And so uh, the more triangles, the more readmissions there have been in that subgroup. And what we see here is that the patients with major depression have many more readmissions over time than the patients who are not depressed. And the ones with minor depression fall somewhere in the middle. I'll also point out that if you look at the first uh, 90 days in this graph, the, the lines don't diverge. They don't start really diverging until around 90 to 100 days. And so here again, this kind of confirms our conjecture that um, looking at 30-day readmissions is probably the wrong time frame for thinking about the effect of depression. It's not manifest over small intervals. It's manifest over a longer period of time. Now, we also um, did a national death index search on this cohort after 20 years, and we supplemented the NDI search with Social Security death index and uh, electronic medical records and online obituaries. And we were able to uh, determine the vital status of every single patient in the cohort, 94% of whom died uh, during that follow-up period. 20% of the deaths were in the first year of follow-up. The median survival time uh, after the index admission was uh, 3.8 years. And uh, here we found that major depression at index was a pretty robust predictor of uh, long-term um, survival, um, as was New York heart, uh, age, uh, being male, having a history of ischemic heart disease, having prior hospitalizations for heart failure, having COPD, and having a high BUN. And uh, this is what the uh, survival curve looks like. So you can see they, uh, they div diverge after several months and stay uh, pretty much in parallel over the entire 20 year period. So here again, we see the effect of depression unfolding over a period of years and not just something that uh, is important in the short run. So we see uh, from this and other studies that depression has a modest at best effect on short term survival and heart failure, but a, a significant effect on longer term survival. And uh, we know much more, uh, thanks in part to uh, Matt's work on uh, mechanisms underlying the effects of uh, depression and other uh, psychiatric problems in coronary heart disease, uh, such as the inflammation, autonomic uh, nervous system dysregulation, um, perhaps uh, inadequate uh, self-care of heart failure. We know uh, less about heart failure mechanisms than we do about coronary disease. So we are uh, now uh, looking at a new data set, um, patients that we enrolled just several years ago while hospitalized, uh, to see whether or not we can um, replicate uh, the rehospitalization finding at a more contemporary cohort, because obviously uh, much has changed uh, both in the treatment of uh, heart failure over these years since the 1990s, but also in the composition of the heart failure population. Um, we're also asking this time something that we, uh, we weren't really able to do before, and that is, um, what is the direction of this re relationship? Uh, it's very possible that depression is driving a higher rate of rehospitalizations, but it's also plausible that perhaps uh, being hospitalized over and over again is depressing. It's disruptive, uh, it's demoralizing, um, it may uh, have uh, effects on, on mood and functioning for a variety of reasons. 
So we're taking a look in this study at the uh, question of whether there's really a reciprocal relationship or whether it's, it's actually the opposite of what we thought and it maybe is actually hospitalizations driving depression rather than the other way around. So we enrolled a cohort of 400 patients uh, with heart failure, followed them up for two years. We administered the PHQ-9 depression questionnaire every three months and some other assessments every six months. And uh, we documented all cause readmissions via uh, medical record review. The, uh, the patients uh, demographically are fairly similar to uh, the previous cohort, although the uh, ones who are depressed are even slightly younger than the ones uh, before were. Uh, we still have about 50% male and uh, a little higher percentage of minorities in the sample than we did before. And here we see, um, cutting down to the, uh, the effect of depression, uh, this time measured by the PHQ, it does have a significant effect on multiple rehospitalizations, along with COPD, hypertension, um, uh, the uh, renal disease uh, for one reason or another seems to have uh, what looks like a productive, protective effect, although that might be uh, a, um, a healthy survivor effect, essentially. But New York Heart and also uh, the younger patients actually uh, have a uh, slightly higher risk. Here's what those curves look like. So this is a little different than what we found before in that the patients with the mild cases of depression don't really look any different than the non-depressed patients do. But we see a very clear separation of the patients with the more severe cases of depression. They are having um, quite a few more rehospitalizations over time. And here again, just like we did before, that divergence doesn't happen in the first month. It doesn't even happen in the first three or four months. It takes uh, here about six months before we start seeing a difference between the depressed and the uh, non-depressed cohort. Now looking at the opposite question, uh, does uh, do readmissions over time uh, seem to affect depression? The first thing we did to look at this was <clears throat> plot the trajectories, the average trajectories of depression over time, depending on how many rehospitalizations there are. So we see in the black line here, this is the level of depression over time in people who have been readmitted either zero times or one time. And then as we go up, there are more readmissions, more readmissions. And here are the green line are patients who get readmitted at least five times after our initial assessment. So we see there on average over time, much more depressed and chronically so than the ones who are not getting readmitted so much. So this uh, gives us more reason to wonder, is it possible that readmissions are fueling more depression? But when we look at that uh, in, in a model that's capable of studying that in the correct way, we see that uh, the total number of readmissions over time has no effect on, on the uh, level of depression. We do see uh, typical predictors of depression, a uh, history of depression as a strong effect. Um, antidepressant use has a paradoxical effect. We uh, typically find this in our cohort studies of cardiac patients. Uh, you would think if antidepressants were a really great and effective drug that the people on antidepressants would be less likely to be depressed rather than more. It doesn't work that way. People get put on antidepressants, uh, whether they work or not, they're often left on them. Um, and uh, even if they are working, even if they are helping, it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, lead to a full remission. It often leads to partial remission. And so we often see an association between antidepressant use and, and more depression rather than that this drug uh, somehow makes it all go away. It doesn't really work like that. We also see uh, patients with AFib have a slightly lower risk. The patients with COPD uh, have a, a lot higher uh, risk of depression. Uh, higher New York heart classes are much more likely. Uh, slightly uh, lower risk for younger patients 
and um, slightly lower risk over time. So people, if anything, tend to improve a little bit. Uh, now, turning uh, to self-care, what is heart failure self-care? Uh, the National Center for Biotechnology Information defines self-care as behaviors that can help to prevent illness uh, or also caring for self when ill. And there are some self-care behaviors that are specific to a particular illness, such as heart failure, and others that are relevant for multiple illnesses. Um, there are some illnesses like diabetes that can require pretty extensive, frequent self-care and other conditions that um, don't require much of, out of the patient. Um, heart failure self-care involves multiple behaviors and cognitions, and it can be quite challenging for many patients. Um, there are really uh, three domains of self-care that have been recognized in the literature. Uh, one is what's known as maintenance, which is those are the uh, behaviors that a patient needs to um, follow through over time to maintain both their general health and to um, sort of uh, deal with heart failure and, and perhaps slow its progression uh, if possible. Self-care management is uh, more uh, responding to signs and symptoms when they arise. What do you do, for example, when you're experiencing uh, edema uh, or a sudden increase in dyspnea? What do you do about that? Do you even recognize that you're having a problem? And if you do recognize it, what do you do? So these are two different aspects. And then uh, confidence in one's ability to do what's necessary uh, pertains to both of those kinds of uh, dimensions of self-care, um, but it is separable from the actual behaviors that people engage in. So uh, under the category of uh, self-care maintenance for heart failure, people have to check their weight to find out if they're developing edema. Um, they have to check for ankle swelling. They have to keep up on their vaccinations, their physical activity, uh, go to their appointments, uh, stick to a low salt diet and take prescribed medications. Management, dealing with problems when they arise, they have to be able to recognize symptoms, deal with their salt intake, uh, fluid intake, their diuretics, and they need to know when to call the doctor or nurse uh, versus when to just uh, kind of write it out. And then uh, again, confidence, uh, there's uh, different levels of confidence in all different kinds of aspects of heart failure and people who don't feel very confident in, in their knowledge of what to do tend to be hesitant to act. Now, some heart failure self-care behaviors are relatively easy for patients to initiate and maintain. Uh, others can be quite difficult and they require uh, new knowledge and skill acquisition, uh, often changing of longstanding habits and uh, often giving up something that's highly rewarding for patients, like cutting down on salt. That often doesn't go over very well with people, and, and even somebody who's severely ill may be very reluctant to take that sort of a step to uh, uh, protect themselves. Uh, and unfortunately, comorbidities in heart failure may have other self-care requirements, possibly even ones that are contradictory to the ones that they're being told to engage in for their heart failure. And so um, with patients with increasing levels of multimorbidity, the self-care demands on them become increasingly complex and confusing. And so it's really no wonder that self-care behavior can be uh, quite difficult to change. But self-care, uh, we know from uh, studies, uh, can have effects on all cause and heart failure related hospitalizations, risk of death, cost of care, and quality of life. Um, we also know, uh, uh, particularly from some work uh, from your department, uh, that interruptions in heart failure medication regimens uh, can affect multiple parameters that are relevant to heart failure pathophysiology. And of course, uh, medication adherence is one of the most important dimensions of heart failure self-care. So uh, we know that uh, chronically inadequate self-care contributes uh, to faster uh, progression of heart failure, uh, more and more problems, and uh, temporary lapses can uh, wind somebody up in the hospital. So this is um, 
uh, both a difficult uh, and a consequential problem. So uh, we looked in the same cohort of 400 patients, uh, first cross-sectionally at, is it really true that depression is an impediment to heart failure self-care? Uh, we hypothesized that there is a positive relationship, or I'm sorry, an inverse relationship between uh, depression and self-care. It's been hinted at in the literature, but not studied very, uh, very well. And yes, indeed, we found that uh, depression is inversely associated with all of these dimensions of uh, self-care after adjusting for all kinds of uh, covariates. Uh, does inadequate heart failure self-care predict multiple readmissions? Well, we find when we look just at self-care at baseline, predicting multiple readmissions over two years, we find that confidence and maintenance at baseline predicts. And remember, maintenance is the stuff that people need to do over the long haul to kind of maintain their health and, and uh, stay, um, stay in better shape. Uh, management doesn't seem to have that effect. But when we look at how self-care changes over time in relation to readmissions over time, we see that confidence doesn't really matter, but those maintenance behaviors tend uh, to still have an effect on how many readmissions the person's going to have. And this is even after adjustment for depression and other covariates. And so uh, this leads us to think, well, what is it then that's going on here? And we see, again, looking back at this same uh, uh, picture, that um, when a person is first diagnosed with heart failure, they may have a very low level of symptoms. It may not be affecting them much. They may not really grasp what it means or what's, what it portends. And so uh, they may really not be doing much in terms of health care. They may have uh, either no idea or wrong ideas about what they should be doing to take care of themselves. And so it can take a while, both for their physicians uh, to uh, figure out the, the best medication regimen and management strategy, but also for the patient to start acquiring self-care knowledge and skills. And uh, once things get under control, maybe um, there's a more plateau phase where those self-care maintenance behaviors uh, really can uh, help keep things stabilized. But then when we get into the uh, more terminal phase, then those self-care behaviors uh, cease to make much of a difference. Um, we know from working with many of these patients that many, if not most patients, just don't get it when they get their uh, uh, brief little heart failure education after their first hospitalization. You know, on the last day of hospitalization, they get a visit from a nurse and they, they get told about uh, some self-care issues and maybe they get a brochure or something. It just, for many patients, it just does not sink in or they're confused or they get it wrong. And so many patients take uh, much longer than that and more information to acquire self-care knowledge and uh, skills. Uh, and so these findings have led me to come up with a, a new hypothesis. You're really the first people to be hearing about this. And that is there's really two flavors of self-care and heart failure. One is what I would call reactive self-care, which is um, that the patient starts engaging in, in self-care behaviors, maybe appropriately eventually, but that is being uh, motivated by problems. It's motivated by readmissions, by worsening heart failure, by exacerbations. And so you see in that case a positive correlation between more and more readmissions and more and more self-care. In other words, they're behind the curve. Uh, that's what's motivating the patient to increase their self-care, and it's a losing battle. And so for that patient, trying harder is not going to be rewarded. They're, they're not getting anywhere with their self-care, and, and so it's more and more discouraging. As opposed to proactive self-care, in which uh, the patient initiates self-care appropriately when heart failure is diagnosed or soon thereafter, and gets better at it over time. And this kind of proactive self-care may make more of a difference. Uh, the course may be better than it otherwise would be. And so the implications of that, if this is really true, uh, 
that we need uh, to pay more attention to self-care early in the course of heart failure uh, when there's still an opportunity for it to make a, a bigger difference. And that um, uh, patients may need some additional help or uh, either with maintenance of their good habits or uh, development of new knowledge and skills as the course of heart failure changes over time. And also uh, it's going to be important to treat depression sooner rather than la later to reduce it as a barrier to acquisition of self-care uh, skills and knowledge, among other reasons to treat depression. So this is something uh, I hope to uh, work on more in uh, future research. What about treatment of depression and heart failure? I am sorry to tell you that the largest antidepressant trials have not been encouraging about antidepressants. The two biggest ones by far are the Sad Heart CHF trial uh, that was uh, conducted at Duke by O'Connor and colleagues. And we see here uh, treatment with sertraline versus placebo in a randomized controlled trial. Uh, really no difference between uh, drug and placebo. And we see the same thing in the European Mood HF trial, Angerman et al. No difference whatsoever in depression uh, between um, escitalopram and placebo. I do want to point out, however, that you see in both of these studies a, a pretty precipitous drop early on and a gradual improvement over time in both arms. And uh, I hate to be uh, recommending uh, a pill just for its placebo value, but even if that happens to be the case here, uh, it seems to me that it's a good option. These uh, medications are fairly uh, safe for patients with heart failure. And uh, regardless of the mechanism why they're helping, patients do on average seem to benefit when, when they start taking these medications. Um, and I would also add there are not a lot of great alternatives. Uh, so I would say don't let these trials be too discouraging that it's still important to recognize depression and to treat it with um, first-line antidepressants. But I also want to point you to a study that was not about heart failure per se. The largest open-label pragmatic trial of treatments for major depression that's ever been conducted is known as the STAR-D trial. This enrolled uh, over 2,800 patients. Uh, and uh, unlike many depression trials, it included a mixture of both medically well and medically ill patients. Um, the first level treatment was citalopram uh, on an escalating dose uh, starting at 20 and winding up at 60 per day. Although for various reasons, the average uh, final dose was closer to 40. The remission rate varies depending on how it was measured, but uh, according to one metric, it was around 28%. And uh, the patients in this trial uh, went on uh, to level two if they didn't respond to citalopram. At level two, they, they got augmentation with citalopram or switched to a different medication or perhaps to psychotherapy with cognitive behavior therapy. And uh, additional patients uh, remitted at the second level but uh, some didn't, and they went on to levels three or four if necessary. So there were a variety of options at this different level. For example, some patients were switched to sertraline. Other patients were switched to cognitive therapy. Some patients had uh, augmentation of citalopram with a drug or with therapy. And then um, the, the treatments got progressively more aggressive, let's say, uh, as the levels went on. And we see over the course of these levels that only about a third of patients responded at level one, but over half of the patients responded uh, by level two. And um, they picked up a few additional uh, remissions at the more aggressive levels. So I think the lesson of this is that if a patient doesn't respond to the first line antidepressant, um, that's uh, not a good reason to give up or to leave them on that antidepressant. It's a good idea to try switching or augmentation. And if that doesn't work, uh, it's a good reason to uh, maybe consider referral to uh, a psychiatrist or other mental health uh, professional uh, for perhaps 
a more aggressive treatment for treatment resistant depression. Uh, just a word about cognitive behavior therapy. It's a well-established intervention for major depression in medically well patients. We did a trial several years ago testing it in heart failure patients. We randomly assigned patients to CBT or usual care. They got up to six months of therapy. Uh, and we see that there was a significant effect on depression at six months and that this effect was well maintained over time. In terms of remission of major depression, 46% uh, remitted in the CBT group versus only 19% in the usual care arm. And this is despite the fact that many patients in usual care um, had antidepressant therapy from their own physicians for a, a very good number needed to treat of 3.76. Um, how about interventions to improve self-care? Most trials so far uh, have found small to medium effects on self-care outcomes and less benefit on depressed patients. One of the largest trials ever of uh, heart failure self-care intervention was conducted in Chicago with over 900 patients uh, randomized to uh, a 18-session uh, self-management intervention versus educational intervention with a two to three-year follow-up. They got absolutely no effects on the primary endpoint or on uh, secondary endpoints. So uh, it just goes to show you self-care is not an easy target of intervention. A lot of it looks simple and basic, but it really can be difficult for people to, to understand what to do and to act accordingly. Um, so I would just say in clinical practice, patients are gonna need a lot more than what they ordinarily get in order to really get good at self-care. Self-care also was a secondary outcome in our CBT trial uh, we uh, tried to fold in some basic self-care goals, but we didn't really get very far on it. So we concluded that uh, trying to integrate uh, self-care behaviors and confidence into treatment of depression didn't really work out. And so in our current trial, which uh, we hope to wrap up over the next six months, we're treating depression with CBT first and antidepressants when needed. And then following that up with a more intensive, individually tailored self-care intervention administered by a cardiac nurse. And so we want to see whether patients who are less depressed when they start uh, working on self-care have better self-care outcomes than the patients who are still depressed when they try to work on that. So to conclude, depression is a common psychiatric comorbidity and heart failure. Uh, it's associated with poor self-care and diminished quality of life. It predicts multiple rehospitalizations and shorter survival. Uh, the first line treatments that are most often uh, recommended in uh, CHF and also in CHD patients are uh, escitalopram, citalopram, or sertraline. They all have a pretty good safety record with cardiac patients, um, less of a stellar record in terms of efficacy. And then uh, we know from Sardi, and not so much from cardiac patients per se, that there are lots of possibilities for switching or augmentation. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy can be a good option if, it, if the patient prefers and if it's available. And also patients with more resistant cases of depression, uh, should uh, you consider a referral for psychiatric or psychological services? This is particularly important because data from the enriched trial that Matt and I were involved in and in other studies as well, we know that patients with uh, depressive symptoms that persist despite treatment are at higher risk of mortality than patients who respond to treatment. So treating somebody for depression uh, in, the, in the context of heart disease but seeing that the depression treatment fails, that's not a good sign, and it's a reason to refer them for depression care. Uh, appropriate heart failure self-care can help to reduce the risk of preventable readmissions. Minimal heart failure education translates into appropriate self-care in relatively few cases, so we need more work on effective self-care interventions, especially early on and uh, more sustained kind of interventions. But in the meantime, I would like to recommend the, uh, the education modules that are provided by the Heart Failure Society of America. I think of all of the information out there, 
for heart failure patients, this is really some of the best. And it can help patients uh, work through different issues in self-care that they need to know about. And again, treating major depression uh, is important for a variety of reasons, and uh, not the least of which is to reduce it as a barrier to heart failure self-care. I'd be happy to provide the uh, references if uh, anybody is interested. But with that, I will uh, conclude and uh, be happy to take any questions that we might have time for. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, please. Um, hi, this is Rachel. Do you hear me? Uh, barely. <laughs> uh, hi, Ken. This is Rachel Lampert. That was a great talk. Um, I have a couple questions, but let me ask you this one first. Um, what you describe as reactive self-care sounds kind of like human nature to me. You know, like when things are going well, you don't bother to do the home PT or whatever it is you're supposed to be doing. And so I wonder what about your, you describe an intent that you're, you're doing studies on an intensive intervention, but you didn't really tell us much about like what that intervention was. So I'm wondering if you could share like what are the components of your intervention that are going to try to, you know, get through that sort of human, human uh, tendency. Great, great question. And you're absolutely right. Uh, all of us, we, we have a hard time imagining the future, especially bad futures. And so when people are first starting out and they may have mild symptoms or they don't really get what heart failure is all about, uh, they're not necessarily uh, uh, eager to jump in and do things, especially the harder and more unpleasant uh, aspects of self-care. Um, our incorrect hypothesis in our earlier trial was that, well, uh, self-care cognition's uh, confidence it's like any other problem that we deal with in, in cognitive behavior therapy. Let's treat it as such. And self-care behaviors, their behaviors like any other, getting people to change uh, things like their uh, adherence to medications or their activity patterns. Let's just do what we usually do uh, in cognitive behavior therapy, but add those in. And what we found is um, many of those behaviors are very difficult uh, to change, even for an experienced cognitive behavior therapist. Um, and uh, part of the, uh, and I would say physical activity is a particularly difficult target. And we know actually from the Action HF trial of a very large uh, uh, multi-center trial of, of physical activity in heart failure, where they had, um, you know, O'Connor and Pena and colleagues uh, had uh, very good success getting people uh, to be uh, to exercise um, at their center, but uh, the the in home phase of the physical activity was much more difficult to get people to ad adhere to over time, um, and so we recognize that that uh, this takes more than integrating it into therapy. Also, it seemed to us that. It's a big enough problem that, uh, that people can't really deal with uh, the issues that are related to depression and other issues that are related to self-care. They can't handle all of that change at once. Maybe we need to think about getting their depression at least somewhat under control first and then working more intensively on self-care. And we learned the hard way, even though our earlier trial had a, a cardiac nurse providing some basic heart failure education and then the, the cognitive therapist taking over and doing the actual intervening. We found out that that's really not the right recipe. This is really a job for somebody that, that um, really understands heart failure well and knows the, uh, the ins and outs of the dietary issues and the medication issues and, and what kind of physical activity is, is okay. And will uh, do goal setting with the patient, informed goal setting, and, and when necessary, working with the physician to identify what is this person really willing to do, able to do, what's okay and safe for them to do, and then working out a plan and uh, working at it over time. So we um, actually, because what we're doing now is individually tailored, I can't tell you yet because we haven't broken the, uh, the data open, but it's going to be different for different patients. Uh, different goals, different emphases, uh, different intensities. And I think um, 
from you know the the supervision uh, meetings, I have a feeling that this is going to have a lot more traction than the the more casual way that we were handling it before. What how this is going to translate into practice, I don't know because this this goes far beyond what's customary for most heart failure patients. Um, and also, we, we don't have the luxury of always starting early on in the patient's uh, heart failure career. We're getting patients when they volunteer for the study. So we'll, we'll learn a little bit from it about what difference does it make whether we're starting early on versus later on. And I think that probably will matter to some degree. But um, I think the, uh, just to conclude on that, the, the typical goals are going to be uh, not too surprising. They're going to be things that uh, people need to work on, but that have difficulty like changing their diet or uh, figuring out how to remember to take their medications uh, and, and physical activity. That's, that's a big one in part because people feel frightened or uh, they don't know how to deal with their dyspnea or other symptoms. Um, and uh, so, a lot of a lot of work and a lot of hand holding on getting people activated in the appropriate ways is what we're really working on. Other questions? Hi, this is on Erica Spatz. Um, I uh, wanted to bring attention to the um, uh, aspect of self management, which is the burden of care. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot of um, heterogeneity in the people who have heart failure. Some people develop it after something acute happens to them and it's, um, you know, an, a real op opportunity to start to uh, make some changes and do more self-management. For other people, you know, it's been decades in the making of um, poor self-care. And so this is yet another um, decompensation for them. And yes. so at that point, tasking them with more self-care is like, you know, an exercise in futility and potentially could be harmful. So I wonder if in some people, when we see that happening, you know, instead of, instead of tasking them more, maybe we should be assuming more from them, taking away that burden of care. I, I'm so sorry, uh, so, so glad you brought this up uh, for several reasons. First of all, it's important to remember that many patients with heart failure are also caregivers, right? They may have an ill uh, spouse or a, a child with special needs that they're taking care of. So they're not only taking care of themselves, they may be taking care of somebody else as well. And you, you mentioned that, that adding to the burden of self-care may be harmful. There actually is some data that particularly in um, depressed patients that uh, self-care interventions might cause more problems than, than, than good. Um, and you also mentioned that uh, heart failure uh, may be occurring in the, in the context of multimorbidity. So when I say that uh, it may be better to start, you know, working on this early in the heart failure career, for some of this, maybe uh, the important thing is to start well before heart failure starts, when the person is starting to have trouble with heart disease or hypertension or diabetes, uh, maybe uh, we need to get far ahead of the curve. And yes, I think there is a growing recognition that um, multimorbidity is uh, nothing to trifle with. And that as people get more and more complicated, it gets more and more difficult and confusing to deal with any one of the conditions that they have, much less all of them. And in some cases, the, the advice they're getting or their recommendations or, or whatever are, are um, not only adding to the burden, but in some cases, they're just frankly incompatible with each other. And they don't know what to do, but they kind of say to hell with all of this. Um, and so I think in the, in the context of multimorbidity, it's important uh, to, uh, for people to not get siloed and focused on a particular disease, but rather to take the patient as a whole, uh, to step back and say, well, here's all these different things you're dealing with. Uh, what are your goals? What are your priorities? What's going to matter the most to you? What's your doctor, uh, you know, really stressing that uh, seems to um, be more important than the other things? Uh, what might be expendable? And, and do goal setting accordingly. And I completely agree with you that just sort of diving in and insisting that uh, 
you've got to deal with the illness that I care about and to hell with what everybody else is pestering you about. That's not a recipe for success. I think we, we have to be um, taking a, a, a much more uh, sophisticated look at uh, patients with multimorbidity. You know, uh, Ken, as I listen to you talk about this, you, you know, what keeps coming to mind for me is that what's required is a multidisciplinary team. Yes, yes. That, that the physician brings a particular expertise. The, the cardiac nurse brings a particular expertise. The dietitian brings a particular expertise, pharmacist, and the psychologist, who yes. may bring an essential expertise in terms of how to really uh, support the patient in managing uh, their disease. I see that uh, Dr. Velasquez has his hand up. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, hey, Matt, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Can, uh, Dr. Friedman, first, first of all, thank you for a, for a good talk, um, a great talk. Um, I guess the question I have is really following up on when I think back at the, um, the eight faction experience, there was a certain amount of a group um, effect, I would say. And one thing you haven't spoken to is whether uh, we can approach um, depression and heart failure care from the perspective of developing uh, communities. People go um, as a uh, to do group behavior and and uh, and therapy, uh, or um, you know uh, families, or to highlight the fact that uh, one of the strengths that they do that Eric, you're breaking up. To the same extent, I'm curious about the value and how that's been tested of, of uh, uh, it, it. Well, uh, unfortunately, I've, I've lost the, uh, the audio. So I'll respond to what I think you may be asking, which is uh, uh, about the potential value of, of group approaches uh, where maybe uh, other patients and possibly even family members might be involved in, in some aspects of this. Um, I have mixed uh, views on that. Uh, we know, for example, in the ENRICH trial that uh, there was both an individual and a group component. And the patients loved the, the group sessions, uh, seemed to get a lot out of it. Um, there's some possibility that they, uh, the ones who participated in the group did better. Um, I have to say, though, I'm finding uh, with the patients with heart failure that we're seeing increasingly, and this is a change from what used to be the case, um, we're seeing more and more psychosocial distress on, in multiple dimensions. Um, we're seeing people who are uh, having uh, serious financial strains and and problems with uh, domestic violence or living in violent neighborhoods or um, uh, all kinds of uh, family problems. Uh, and, and, and as has been pointed out, often uh, multimorbidity. These are often very complicated people with difficult and challenging lives all aside from their heart failure. And so um, getting them to be able to attend appointments or group sessions, or even individual sessions, I my sense is it's becoming an increasing challenge. And we're rather than uh, stressing interventions that require a whole bunch of people to convene all together, all at the same time, we need to start thinking more about how to meet patients where they are, deal with the fact that many of them have transportation problems, uh, they're they're pressed for time, they're stressed out. Uh, how can we find ways to help them uh, without adding to that stress? And um, 
I think offering uh, group approaches uh, for people that can benefit from that, whether in person or online, I think um, there's a lot of value in that, but I don't think we can rely very heavily on that. I think we have to keep more of a focus on, on the individual patient. Sarah, uh, Hull has her hand raised. Go ahead, Hi. Sarah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful talk. And just to piggyback on, on some of those comments and also um, some of the content that um, Erica Spatz actually brought up in a, uh, at a recent Grand Rounds, um, I, I think that, you know, it, it's obviously really important to talk about what are the individual challenges that, that these patients face, both in their own lives and in the lives of those around them. But I, I think, too, it's, we, we really can't ignore all of the social determinants of health that are really un undoubtedly driving this. And I think it would be interesting to, you know, see how much more difficult the self-care is based on socioeconomic status or, or other factors. But, you know, I, it, it's e even relatively well-to-do patients struggle to eat healthy food because the default in this country is just an absolutely abysmal diet. And so then, then you have people in food deserts and it's, it's easy to say, and, and, and again, you completely acknowledge this. It's, it's hard when, you know, we're used to self, self care feeling like, okay, comfort food. So I'm going to eat this salty soup and then a salty snack, but our, our, our defaults and our systems are set up in a way that we're, we're really setting people up to fail. And um, I, I, I think that in addition to advocating for better individual and group level support, we, I really think we have a duty to elect leaders who are going to prioritize making access to healthy food and prevent, you know, freedom from pollution and other toxic factors of priority. And, and we have a duty to advocate for those things because we're fighting an uphill battle and we're on the same side of these patients. But exactly as you said, um, you know, when, when they're facing so many unbelievable challenges, that that's not going to be enough for us as a as a healthcare team to to surmount, and it really is going to take um, broader social and and political changes to to I, I think really change outcomes and and push the needle. I I completely agree. I, I also want to add uh, we're just starting up a new study of uh, hospitalized patients with heart failure where we were looking at the sort of convergence of social determinants of health and uh, psychiatric uh, comorbidities, not just depression, but a broader range of psychiatric comorbidities and a broad range of social determinants of health, um, which I think may uh, operate together in a variety of ways to complicate the situation for patients. I, I want to say in particular, uh, one, one kind of uh, issue that's been a, a particular concern to me is uh, substance abuse and particularly uh, alcohol and uh, stimulant abuse, and to a lesser degree, uh, opioid abuse. Because we know that, that um, cocaine and meth uh, amphetamine, to a lesser degree, and alcoholism can play an etiological role in, in um, cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And um, those problems uh, typically, and, and smoking, they just don't magically go away when uh, the person develops heart failure. So we see quite a few people uh, with, with serious substance abuse problems uh, being admitted with heart failure. And, and uh, really, it's just not so clear what to do about that. Oddly, the epidemiological studies that have been done so far uh, paradoxically have shown uh, patients with alcohol abuse or uh, 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 stimulant abuse have better heart failure outcomes rather than worse. And my interpretation of that is that this substance abuse uh, pattern is uh, accelerating their heart failure career. So we're seeing this happening more in younger patients. Uh, and so because they're in generally better health, they're having better outcomes in the short run, but over the long haul, it's going to be worse for them. So uh, I think uh, this is something that uh, we need to look uh, at uh, middle-aged and older patients and see uh, uh, what's evolving with their uh, substance abuse. But that's very much tied into these other kinds of social pathologies. 
and something I think we really need to pay more attention to. Any other questions, comments? Because uh, we are well over our time. And so, um, if not, I just want to once again thank uh, Ken Friedland for joining us this morning. And really unfortunate that it could not have been done in the more traditional way with a visit here. I just from these this presentation this morning and the few comments and questions, I think there's a lot that we would have had to talk about, uh, maybe even plan together, and uh, certainly look forward to. Uh, having further conversations with Ken uh, about this. And uh, for anyone who's interested, I could forward Dr. Friedland's um, email address. Um, and uh, uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your attention. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.